Good afternoon. My name is Jenny Breyer, and I'm the Director of Gender and Women's Studies here at UIC. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the third and final for this term campus conversation sponsored by the Provost, Susan Poser. Dr. Poser is traveling um, and sends her regrets to all of you that she can't be here today. She's asked me to step in as a member of the committee um, that helps plan these sessions to introduce you to this truly wonderful panel of UIC faculty who will talk to us today about climate change and what we can do about it. Before I introduce our panel, I want to say a few things about the Campus Conversation series and about work taking place on campus that relates to and addresses issues of climate change. First, I want to thank Aisha El Amin, Judy O.L. Chenko, oh, Kelsey Gowan, for their administrative prowess in getting this series to happen three times each semester. It is truly uh, phenomenal. And my fellow committee members, Amanda Lewis, who's the director of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy, Andy Clarno, who is the interim director of the Social Justice Initiative, and Carolyn Swinney, who works in the Office of Diversity. Second, I want to let people know that we are planning our sessions for the spring and welcome ideas from you for future topics that you would like to hear about. Um, think about some of the biggest issues that you face and who you would like to hear from um, and talk to and let us know. Some ideas that are starting to float are on mental health, election politics, freedom of speech and freedom to protest. Other topics are certainly possible and I know that the provost hopes to continue this series next year. Finally, and this is the case I think more often than we sometimes give ourselves credit for, there is always so much going on at UIC. Um, and so much going on around uh, issues of climate change, and so I wanted to let you know what some of those are. There's a conference coming up at the end of this week at the Institute for the Humanities on the Anthropocene, the concept that marks our current time as part of an epic when humans impacted the Earth's geology and ecosystem. That conference, Political Ecology as Practice, a Regional Approach to the Anthropocene, is organized by faculty in art history and anthropology, and I know that Max is going to be speaking there. It's Thursday and Friday of this week. Um, you can find more out at the Institute for the Humanities. The Office of Sustainability is in the process of finalizing its campus um, action plan for climate change and there are people from the Office of Sustainability here wearing their eco educator t-shirts and you can see them um, to ask questions or visit their website for more information. Now on to our panel. Um, we were really, I was really charged with thinking about what a diverse and interdisciplinary group of UIC faculty can tell us about the state of climate and climate change and what kinds of actions we can take. Um, and what is striking to me about the faculty here is that we have people from four um, different colleges uh, and what that means about our ability to really engage this question from a broad range of perspectives. Our fifth panelist is coming from downtown, and I know he may be a few minutes late, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, and so I'll introduce people in the order in which they'll speak, um, and then they'll have a dialogue among themselves and open it up for questions from the audience. And we've distributed cards, which you can use or not use, depending on how you're feeling. I, this is the first time we're using cards in a technical conversation, so it may be difficult to write on one piece of paper, but let's see, we're, we're a nice size group for having a discussion. Um, so I will introduce people in order and start with Max Berkelhammer, who is Assistant Professor of Earth and Environmental Science. His research focuses on the water cycle and how ecological systems around the world respond to changes in the availability of water. Before um, becoming a researcher, he was a high school history teacher, which of course makes him best skilled for teaching us about science. <laughs> Professor Berkelhammer will be our moderator today. He's also the lead off speaker and has been instrumental in organizing the discussion um, and, and incredibly generous with his time to me in organizing and helping to get together the people here. Um, so he will set the stage for us and then 
uh, the people who follow will comment on various parts of their research and his work, and we'll sort of take it from there. Professor Sybil Darable, who is joining us a little bit later, is Associate Professor of Sustainable Infrastructure Systems in the Civil and Materials Engineering Department here at UIC, and the Director of the Complex and Sustainable Urban Network, CSUN Lab. His research interests center on planning, design, and modeling of urban infrastructure, how this is where I am a historian, so I get a little nervous, but I'm going to do my best. How geometric and topological networks feature um, in infrastructure and how that can be part of the sort of vital pieces of designing smart cities. Professor Sarap Erdahl is Associate Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences um, in the School of Public Health and on the faculty at the Institute for Health Research and Policy. Uh, she researches many issues related to environmental justice and is in the middle of an NSF-funded study to train citizen scientists to collect air samples in various Chicago neighborhoods to help map the effects of local environmental hazards. She sits with me on a committee in the office of the Vice Chancellor for Research, and I'm delighted to be able to be engaged with her here. Professor Matthew Winter is Assistant Professor of Finance in the College of Business. Um, his research interests include a range of different kinds of international finance. He's interested in international corporate um, finance as well as behavioral finance, the ways in which and the ideas around which um, we come to understand how people make the decisions they make with money and finance. He's written about how global capital responds to national disasters and will add a different piece to this conversation about how we understand and can respond to national, uh, to natural disasters and climate change. Uh, finally, Professor Moira Zellner is Associate Professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy and a Research Associate Professor in the Institute for Environmental Science and Policy. Before coming to the U.S., she worked in Argentina as an environmental consultant for local and international environmental engineering firms. Um, at UIC, she examines how specific policy, technological, and behavioral factors influence the emergence and impacts of a range of climate, of complex environmental problems. And the task today is for us to have a discussion about climate change and what we can do about it in the context of a world where the people who are committed to doing this work are changing and decreasing and increasing in different categories. And so, um, Professor Berkelhammer has really been um, thinking about these questions, and so I offer that as introduction. And I'll be back later to help moderate the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny, for the introduction, and uh, thank, thanks to the provost for organizing the event. It's a real Honored to be here and speak here, and thank you all for coming. To, to reiterate, um, in that introduction, we as faculty can talk a lot. That's what we do for a living. Love to talk. So uh, if you don't ask questions, that's what we're going to do. So I really encourage you <laughs> to ask questions and, and, and be involved, because that's what this time is really about. So I'd also like to thank my panelists for taking the time to, to, to join me here today. So um, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to use some graphs. This is, i just warn you in advance, not a whole lot. But um, I wanted to start with this, because this is really one of the canonical pictures uh, of, that depicts climate change. And it's a picture of Earth temperature projections out to the next 300 years. And I've taken this figure from the Intergovernmental Panel on Cli Climate Change, which is a, it, it's a, uh, multinational organization to try to come to consensus views on how the climate is changing. And if you look at this figure, I want to point out a few things here. There's depicted here three trajectories, possible trajectories. There's in red what we call business as usual, and that's the ride we are on currently, which is that we continue to utilize uh, fossil fuels as, as we currently are and, and continue to grow as population grows. Um, there's a middle pathway where fossil fuel use peaks in 2040 and we start to decline uses and, and in purple there in the bottom, a scenario where we have already reached that and we're beginning to decline our reliance on that. If 
fuel source. If you look at this figure, and this is one of the more complicated things about this figure, is around each of these lines, there's this, um, this cloud, this, this range of possible uncertainty. And so that, that, cl that cloud around each of those lines, each of those individual lines, is, represents our uncertainty of the climate system itself. So this is not about the human behavioral part of it, but just the climate system itself. And you can ask, why, why is the future so uncertain? What, what makes these clouds so wide, these possible scenarios for the future so, so uh, unclear? And so um, I'll, I'll give an example of, of how that comes to be, that, sort of, that source of uncertainty. Um, from some of my own work, this is a photograph I took in Greenland looking out onto the Greenland ice sheet here. Um, and you can make out here the receding edge of the Greenland ice sheet. So each year we'd come back and, and watch this. Um, if you watch Game of Thrones, maybe any Game of Thrones fans in here? This, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this looks like the wall. Um, and the wall is moving back every year. So what happens when the wall moves back here is uh, you replace the ice, which is light colored and reflects energy and cools the planet with plants that absorb CO2 and make uh, the climate cooler. Um, so that has a positive effect on temperature trajectories. On the other hand, you've replaced a white surface with a darker surface that absorbs more energy and warms the climate. So as this system changes, there's a push in the pull. So there's two um, competing forces acting on the climate system, and we don't necessarily know how that push and pull will play out. So as temperatures continue to rise, these new lands may become forests, and they may pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and cool the climate, or they may remain semi-arid tundras, and the climate will continue to accelerate its warming rate. So um, this sort of cloud exists around, this uncertainty exists because we're not sure how aspects of the climate system will react to warming. Um, and this is part of what my, my research is trying to reduce the size of that cloud, to reduce that uncertainty. Now, there's another source of uncertainty here, which is that there's three possible trajectories for human behavior here. One, where we change our use of fossil fuels at different times um, moving forward into the future. Now, human behavior exists across spectrums. So this is a very simplified depiction of three possible scenarios. Um, and that, that could include what would affect these possible trajectories, new energy technologies that may make greenhouse gases obsolete, alternatively, new oil discoveries which may make fuels cheaper, government subsidies or taxes on certain types of energy use, changes in transportation technology. This is the human element of it. But if you add up the full range of uncertainty, um, and this is why it's, it's a real pleasure to sit with individuals from finance, from urban planning, from engineering, and from health, is that the full range of uncertainties here is both the climate itself, the uncertainty in the climate system, and our uncertainty in human behavior. And you can't really reduce this uncertainty without getting um, these various people at the table together. So I'd put forward that I think two uh, goals that would make sense in thinking about uh, climate-related policy is a future that is more certain, okay? May not be exactly the future we want, but it's more certain. So we're reducing those clouds around those lines into a future with a climate that's relatively similar to today's. Okay? These, these, these I like to put forward as, as two goals. In order to achieve that, uh, that requires economists, climatologists, ecologists, engineers, et cetera. Okay. Now, as a earth scientist, I'd also like to put uh, what I'm talking about into a little bit of a longer perspective. I consider this the recent history, the last 100,000 years. Um, I realize that's a relative term, but um, this is a history of Earth's temperature over the last 100,000 years. If you notice here, the last 10,000 years when human civilization thrived um, was a quiet period. It, it was a very stable period in, in terms of temperature for Earth's, Earth's history. That was very important for our abil ability to develop agriculture, cities, ex et cetera. Now, if you look at, if you only knew the last 10,000 years and you looked at this stable climate, you might come to a conclusion that climate has a bit of homeostasis in it. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is the climate system is 
self-stabilizing, just like our body temperature has means to self-stabilize. So if you look at this stable temperature, uh, you might come to that conclusion, and it takes this longer historical perspective to see that the, cl the climate is actually quite volatile, um, and it can change quite rapidly um, even without human intervention involved. So it's sort of comforting to imagine climate like today's is what we can expect, but there's little historical evidence to, to provide com comfort in, in that. So if we go back just 100,000 years, the last time Earth was warmer than today, um, again, it's not that far back in time, for my opinion, um, this is what sea levels were, were like at that time. So Florida, for better or worse, underwater. Um, just kidding, that was for worse. Um, and, uh, and if you go back even further in time, there were periods when Earth was covered by glaciers and forests thrived in Antarctica. So the climate we see today, um, it's, it's a snapshot, and it's not hard to imagine very unrecognizable climate systems um, that could exist on this planet, and particularly in the ways that the climate system is currently being perturbed. So I'll, I'll conclude by saying that climate projections, they can seem abstract and a little fantastical. It's hard to imagine um, sea levels rising to the point where Florida is underwater, but a historical perspective um, shows these unrecognizable climates are actually quite normal and uh, we, are, we shouldn't dismiss these severe um, projections simply because you know, we can't visualize them. So um, before I turn it over to my other, uh, the, my, sub, my panel, the other panelists here, I just want to introduce three terms that I, that I recommend that we use in the discourse coming forth. And the first is attribution of climate change. So who, who is to blame? Um, why is the climate changing? And this requires a better understanding of how the climate system responds to human behavior. Second is this concept of mit mitigation. How can we slow down the rate of climate change? So this requires engineering strategies, political will to find alternative energy, transportation, building in, in geoengineering, active modification of the climate. So it's working to slow down the rate of change. And then adaptation, which is accepting there's change coming and what can we do to prepare? And that requires reducing uncertainty, so we actually know what's coming, so we can adapt accordingly, um, but also thinking about engineering, health, design strategies, and of course political will that, you know, to, to, make, to make, this, um, make this happen. So um, I, I thank you again, and um, for giving me the opportunity to provide to a kind of an overview and a, a perspective on this, and I will turn it over to Sybil. Thanks for coming, Sybil. Sorry I'm late, it's uh, tons of things to do, two campuses, that's what happens. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, excited to talk to you about the engineering side of climate change, I think. So that's me, I'm Sybil Darable, uh, that's my QR code, so you can find everything about me there, you can email me there. So I, we have about five minutes, so I just really want to talk to you briefly about some concepts that are really important in my work. So I'm a civil engineer, and my work is really about the future of cities, how do we design cities in the future, especially the engineering systems transport, water, electricity, uh, buildings in a way that's a lot more sustainable. And um, almost everything, that I, so I'm an engineer, so I like to boil down everything to one figure, one equation. Um, this is my favorite figure in the entire world. Everything that I do in the world is for that figure. Uh, and it's very simple. Uh, on the x-axis, so there horizontally, what we have is we're adding stuff to our system. Here I call that complexity, but it's adding stuff to a system. And what we have on the y-axis is all the benefits that we get from that system. Um, so the example that I typically use is we're early settlers in Chicago and we're, we're here and we need to get some water from somewhere. And so we're going to get your water from, well, you're going to get it from the lake. It's right there. It's easy. So we're going to build a lot of, a lot of stuff. We're going to install a lot of pipes and treatment plants and everything to get the water from the lake. And then the benefits are going to be great. And then the city grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And at some point it grows so much that we're too far out and we just can't rely on lake water anymore. So what do we do? Well, we have to go for something else. And of course, because, um, because the lake is not there, so we're, you know, because we can't get to the lake and the lake was the best option, we have to go with the second best option. And so maybe we're gonna go for groundwater. 
And so we're going to, again, add a lot of you know, new pipes and everything in our system. But because it's the second best option, the benefits we're going to get from that are going to get smaller. And if we continue like that, then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we're adding a lot of stuff in our system, and we're really not getting any benefits. And then we, that leads to a collapse. And I'm not the one making that up. It's actually a great book by Joseph Tainter, published in 1988, called The Collapse of Complex Societies. And it's happened many times in the past, you know, Roman Empire, Maya, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> so essentially what we need to do is to change the way we do things. And so that's my work. How do we build cities now in a very completely different way to make sure that we can go back and get a lot of benefits from whatever we do? And that it really applies to absolutely everything as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm thinking even at the university level, I don't know about you, but every year we seem to have a new ethics exam to do, a new something to do, a new this. <laughs> And I really wonder what are the benefits of that. You know, sometimes the first one, I'm sure I did a lot of benefits, but the new ones now, do they really add that much? Mike, it's a gun. So, so it really applies to uh, a lot of things. You know, if we pass a new law, if we come up with a new policy, whatever we do, what are the real benefits that we're gaining out of it? And are we leading towards scenario A, which is collapse, or are we going towards scenario B? And so, um, so what I'm thinking about in engineering, I'm thinking about uh, mitigation, adaptation, adaptation, we talked about that, and then technology. Uh, mitigation, when it comes to, as far as I'm concerned, we absolutely have to continue mitigation simply because we're still dumping a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and we're not helping anyone. So mitigation is obviously something that we must do right now and there's tons of ways of doing that. Uh, adaptation, of course, we also know now that the climate is changing, that uh, the temperature is rising, that we're gonna have to face a lot of extreme events. So adaptation is also something that we always uh, also must do. So I think about 10 years ago, all the focus was on mitigation, nothing on adaptation. And now we really realize it's both. And there's tons of things that we can do and there's tons of technologies that we can use right now. I can tell you that right now, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, we have an extremely um, um, creative and amazing Office of Sustainability who came up with an amazing plan to make the whole campus a lot more sustainable and I really highly recommend that you all look at their uh, commitment um, because it's, it's amazing. And so the, one of the things I'd like is to have a UIC campus that's uh, carbon neutral and I'm hoping that that's going to come uh, soon. And then the role of technology, well that's a dual role where um, we have a lot of technologies now, but we don't have everything, so we'll have to keep working on a lot of technologies. So if you're uh, hoping that technology is going to solve everything, it's not. If you're hoping that it's going to solve a lot, it is. It's going to solve a lot, and, but it's, we're not there yet. So I think that some of the discussion we have today is, uh, well, technology, yes, we have a lot now. We're going to do more in the future, but that's really something that we're going on. But I'm sure Moira is going to tell you more about the human side of things, and I'm more than the technology side of things. So there's two quotes that I like. Uh, these are my two favorite quotes. I've got a favorite figure and I've got two favorite quotes. Uh, the first one is from Einstein and it says, we can't solve a problem by using the same thinking we use when we created the problem. And I love that, especially in engineering because a lot of the things that we do right now in engineering are the same things we've been doing for a long time. So that's why we need to have new ways of doing things. Uh, this is a horrible expression, horrible that I don't like, uh, but it's true. And I heard it from a professor who's 80 years old now, who came up with some research about, I don't know, 40 years ago and the things that he came up with are just getting implemented now. And he said, well, you know, sometimes we say change one funeral at a time. There's some truth to that. I, I, I'm going to say, you know, change one retirement at a time. Yeah, it's going to be nice. a bit more positive. <laughs> but a lot of the things, you know, just take time. And, and I mean, I was talking to someone who used to work for the city of Chicago Water Department. And he told me 10 years ago he was trying to have some uh, discussion about infrastructure and green infrastructure. Nothing was going on. 10 years later, finally, now it's getting there. So we've known for 10 years, but it's that discussion that's ha that has to happen. And then my second favorite quote is from an artist, a great American artist, and its boundaries are defining, but they're not limiting. I don't know if you know Frank Stella's work. It's pretty amazing. But I love that because really my work is about reaching out across disciplines, especially within engineering, getting transport and water and electricity and buildings and everyone together to talk, to come up with solutions. And now we're talking to psychologists and economists as well. And so those boundaries are there, the silos are there, I know, and they define, sort of the, they define the boundaries, but they're not limiting. So we should really work, and that's why we're gonna be able to create a new kind of thinking that's gonna lead us to infrastructure that's gonna both help us mitigate uh, climate change and also adapt to climate change. And that's all I have. I hope it's about five minutes. everybody welcome and um, I want to thank Janet first of all inviting me to this um, <clears throat> uh, event 
point, um, I'm going to be talking to you about the association or the link between climate change and public health. Initially, I'll uh, describe some of the general knowledge we have about this association, but then my rest of my presentation will focus on both mitigation and adaptation approaches that we're taking locally in, uh, in our state, in the county, as well as in the city of Chicago. Um, this is a map of US EPA. Um, it shows us uh, rising temperatures in the last century. As you see, our state is, on average, it has one degree F increase in its um, average temperature in the last century. And, uh, and that has implications. If we look at the potential association between um, what climate change is and what, how it affects our health, um, we follow the, the commonly employed um, source to receptor paradigm. In other words, we have sources of climate change and how that affects human exposures through a increase in temperature, um, increase in extreme weather events, increase in precipitation, and, and how that eventually results in potential health effects in the form of, for example, heat strokes um, and uh, in, in uh, heat stress-related illnesses and injuries. Um, increased temperature results in increased um, uh, formation of ozone in the atmosphere, ground level ozone. Ozone is a harmful pollutant that impacts both our respiratory health and cardiovascular health. Um, in addition, um, there are uh, because of the warming of the atmosphere, we have increased concentrations of pollen and other allergens in the atmosphere that results in increased asthma attacks, at attacks and hospi hospitalizations. We have, with the increase in precipitation and the flooding events, we have more opportunities for the transmission of water and foodborne diseases. And, um, and uh, again, with the warming of the atmosphere, we have increased um, optimum conditions for the growth of vector-borne, um, like ticks and uh, West Nile uh, virus types of bacteria and viruses that results in increased incidences of uh, vector-borne diseases. And uh, in addition, we can't really underestimate the impact on our mental health with the increased droughts, increased um, flood events, people losing their homes, and uh, displacement of people, that adds additional burden on the health of people, resulting in adverse impacts on man mental health. Um, the um, CDC has come up with um, this uh, wheel that tells us the potential linkages between rising temperatures, more extreme weather events, rising sea levels, and the increased carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. These are the four major indicators of climate change and what the potential health effects are in the form of effects um, the increased air pollution and increased allergies and asthma attacks, increased food and vector-borne diseases, malnutrition, diarrheal disease, and um, heat-related illnesses that I already mentioned, and also the societal uh, and the mental stress associated with uh, these impacts. So what, have, what are we doing in our state in regards to um, reduce the impacts of climate change? And, um, and that's what I'm going to focus on in the rest of my time. One of the things that uh, we're fortunate to have in 
um, in our institution at UIC School of Public Health is that we were the recipients of CDC's Building Resilience Against Climate Effects program. We worked with our state and local uh, health agencies under the BRACE program really to create a um, climate um, change mitigation and adaptation plan for the state of Illinois. That work and the PI for this particular grant was um, my division director, Dr. Dorovich, and he um, and his group worked on uh, giving us some more information about how the climate change really presents itself in, uh, in our state. Here what you're seeing is changes in precipitation in Illinois by season. What is very apparent is that both in winter and fall, it's wetter. And in the spring, it has become more wet in the southern part of our state. And we have more, uh, we have increases in the temperature in many of the, in our counties in the summertime. So you're seeing some of the imprints of climate change already in our state. In the figure on the top right, you're seeing the rates of hospitalization for heat stress illness in Illinois from 1987 to 2014. And we're seeing an increased incidences of hospitalization due to heat stress in the southern part of the state, and we have some hypotheses about that. We think that agricultural work conditions, spending time outside contributes to it. In addition, the fact that uh, the homes are uh, not close to one another, they are dispersed, so the communication, the neighborhood alerting and communication system checking on neighbors, and that is not working as well as the urban areas. Um, the figure in the bottom gives us the number of uh, federal flood disaster um, uh, declarations by county from 1981 to 2013. Again, you're seeing that um, we have um, increased uh, flood disaster declarations in our state. So these are some of the symptoms of climate change and some of the ramifications of climate change that we're observing. What I failed to mention is that the seasonal assessment was done comparing 1951 to 1965 data against 2001 to 2015 data. I know from a historical perspective that is not uh, that uh, significant, but I wanted to mention. So this particular figure, again, uh, uh, captures some of the health effects that I already mentioned. Uh, in this figure, what I wanted to, from this busy uh, figure, what I wanted to highlight is the people affected. Um, these are mostly elderly children, people in low-income neighborhoods, people, communities of color. These are also environmental justice communities. So effects of climate change uh, and the public health implications of that is a societal public health issue. It has social and environmental justice implications. In Cook County, um, Cook County is the second most populous county in the country, and it um, constitutes 40% of our state population, and um, Northwestern University took the lead with the, uh, with the leadership from Physicians with Social Responsibility, and they came up with climate change and public health action plan. I'm not going to go, go through all of the uh, recommendations that they've made to uh, mitigate and adapt, uh, create adaptation solutions for different types of um, climate change uh, stimuli like the extreme heat and weather, foodborne diseases, vector-borne diseases, water quality, air pollution. But I'm going to get back to what Max said. All of these uh, problems, they are multidisciplinary. It will require all of us in different disciplines working together to create solutions, to implement solutions, and to look at the effectiveness of the solutions. Lastly, Chicago was the actually frontier in 
uh, coming up with a climate action plan in 2008. Um, and that action plan is ongoing. They just released a progress report, although their action plan doesn't necessarily focus on public health indicators, but um, they are uh, more technology and programmatic administrative uh, oriented, which have public health implications, focusing on energy efficient buildings, clean and renewable energy sources, transportation, waste reduction, and adaptation strategies. Lastly, at the micro level, I want to talk about the wonderful work that our campus is doing uh, with, uh, with the leadership from the UIC Sustainability Office. We're really um, uh, promoting and uh, preaching what we teach our students, and, um, and I want to recognize their effort at micro level. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. Matthew Winter, commonly known as Matt Winter. I'm in the business school, so we can, uh, you know, hopefully raise the level of social trust <clears throat> among how you all probably think about business in general. Let's get into it. <laughs> so we have a bit of a holdup problem. Ideally, we'd love to transfer risk. This is a coordination issue. In areas that are at high risk as a consequence of climate change, you have a high demand for protection. In areas that are in low risk, you have a lower demand for protection. As a consequence, you have this inability to coordinate between those who want the insurance and those who are willing to provide it. Why is this an issue? This becomes an issue because you need coordination. You need governments, you need aid, you need a team. Investors and governments tend to think locally, and they also tend to think very short term. As a consequence of that, it's very difficult to garner the political will necessary to create an environment or to create a market that would help people to transfer this risk. The impacts are rarely isolated. So when you have an extreme event, be it a heat wave or be it a strong storm that comes and kills lots of people, results in lots of devastation that reduces lots of capital, physical capital that's available, those events are rarely isolated. They happen to hit people, but those people also work for firms, and those firms also have investors who are also local. So you have a segmented market that grows more segmented. Why is that important? It's important because within that scenario, local institutions begin to matter. So for those of you who've been fortunate enough to not take a corporate finance class with me, let me explain to you what I'm showing you right now. Here, we have debt maturity. The easy way to think about debt maturity is just the ratio of short-term debt to long-term debt. If I'm a firm, if I'm a company, what I don't want is to have a lot of money that's due very soon because that's going to impact the way that I invest and the way that I deal with risk. Think about your credit card. If your credit card's due tomorrow versus a year from now, it'll impact the way that you spend. What am I showing you? I'm showing you that in countries where people think it's more important to encourage children to save, firms tend to have much shorter debt maturity. We would all agree that it's important to save, that it's important to be thrifty. What we probably wouldn't agree on is this until you see it. Why is that important? It's important because if you look at the countries where people think it's really important to save, you also tend to have a bit more risk of these extreme events occurring. Why is that an issue? Here's why. When you have a natural disaster that's devastating, it's much harder for firms within those markets to raise capital that allows them flexibility. That becomes an issue with how they reinvest and how they redevelop, and that has long-run consequences for development. Oftentimes, we'll wonder when these events occur. There's a direct cost, which is the loss of capital, loss of human life, and then the indirect costs. How long does it take for people to recover? How long does it take for businesses to rebuild? How long does it take for us to basically get back on track? Well, because of something, again, that we would assume is relatively unimportant, like frugality, or like how much people save, or how thrifty they are, because you have this coordination problem, in these countries, when you have a really bad event, like a heat wave come through, or like a flood that's very devastating, it has long-run consequences on firm investment. To explain, 
these plots are showing you different types of investment. What you find is that in these markets where people tend to be more frugal, where people prefer to have self-insurance, where there's a stronger coordination problem, firms reduce their investment at much higher rates the year that it occurs and the year after. Firms, rather than putting money towards capital and towards research and development, you end up putting more money towards cash holdings as a way of providing insurance against these events. Mm -hmm. So that has long-run consequences on development. So uh, I don't have much more to say beyond that. And I look forward to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, hi, I'm Maura Zellner. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me, and thank you for being here. Um, so, as Sybil uh, briefly mentioned, I also work on, on complexity, and I, and I came to, you know, environmental issues and complexity because I started out as an ecologist, um, and, you know, learning about e ecosystems as complex systems that are formed by different parts and interact, uh, and kind of create a system that, beha that behaves in a coherent way and that retains its integrity over time and can adapt and can be robust um, and self-organizing. And so, you know, if you transfer that to, say, cities, cities are also, you know, complex systems where there are multiple parts, residents, firms, um, government officials, organizations that interact, come together to form a city that is not really governed from the top down, even though we do have government, uh, but it's more like perhaps for coordination purposes than really to, you know, direct us all. Uh, markets uh, behave in similar ways. So a lot of my work has been trying to use that framework to understand the interaction and the integration of human systems together with environmental systems as a way to think about, you know, what are pathways towards sustainability and resilience. So here is where the conversation, I hope, starts, because this is the interactive part of the session, so make sure you're paying attention, because I'm going to test you, okay? I just want to illustrate, I, if, if you remember anything about my presentation, I just want to illustrate, you know, this, which is, what is complexity, okay? Here's a very simple model, by the way, you can download this, it's NetLogo, uh, it's a free software developed by Northwestern University, you can, you know, play with it, uh, I teach a class on it. Uh, also, uh, but essentially um, you have here a system that is formed by a road and cars and the cars just interact with each other. There's nothing directing the car except they have their own behavior and they look what is ahead of them. If there's space, they accelerate at this rate. If there's a car ahead of them, they will match that speed but also like decelerate a little bit, like, you know, just hit on the brakes a little bit more, okay? So what happens when we have these rules? That, that's it. That's the entire system and how it works. So what happens when we have these rules? If we run a simulation with it, we'll see that, what, what's, what's coming up here? What, what's happening? They're well, they're not crashes, hopefully not, okay. But is this flowing smoothly? No, what, what's happening? What's emerging from this? Traffic jams, right? And you see that this is an emergence, a concept of emergence from that, that is a defining aspect of our complex systems. You have local level, so going back to businesses, local level interactions, in a way a coordination problem, right? But that in, in that interaction, a behavior syst or a system uh, behavior emerges, which is this traffic jam. In fact, cars are going from left to right, but what's the, what direction is the, tra the traffic jam going? Right to left, okay? So it's a completely different behavior that emerges from this local interaction. The question for you, how do, we, how do we get rid of the traffic jam? With what we have here, okay? We can only change the acceleration and deceleration slider. There's no cheating like changing the number of cars to one. That's not fair. So what would you suggest? I can only change these two things. How do I change them? To, to put what to zero? What do I put to zero? Okay, that doesn't work. Okay. Put that to the same pace. Not quite. Speed up deceleration? Speed up deceleration. I think it's the opposite. 
Say it again in the back. Slow down, Slow down deceleration. Let's look at that one. Yeah. And the winner is. But what does this teach us? This teaches us that sometimes when we understand complexity, we can make very small changes in behavior and completely change the system. Think of what this does to your brakes. Think what this does to your emissions. If you don't have to sit in traffic, I mean, look at the speeds here, right? You got like the speed, like people going up and down, you know, in speed, the, the speed of the system or the highest speed of any car is up to here. But look now where it is when we changed the way that people drove. Okay? So this is just to illustrate, you know, the idea of complexity and what we can do when we understand it. What we can do when we understand, for example, the systems that Max was talking about, when things change, we have like, you know, these ice sheets retreating but now we have a darker surface, but at the same time we have more plants absorbing. This push and pull, how does it really work out? So we can use simulations like these to understand these interactions and what the consequences are. We can overlay these with other kind of biophysical processes. So another aspect in addition to understanding biophysical processes, and these have to do with also behavior as part of the biophysical process, the one that I showed you, is also another aspect that I wanna share. So this is a model that, that we've developed uh, to just show flooding in an urban neighborhood. This is, comes, this is a map of a, a sm uh, of a small area in a neighborhood. These are streets, alleyways, lawns are in green. In dark gray are buildings, and in light gray are like paved surfaces like patios and driveways and things like that. And this is a cross-section of this particular area, so you see that there's a lot of, you know, like a slope there. And so all the water, if I run it again, you'll see it all the water during a precipitation, sorry, will accumulate in this area, which is the lowest area, right? And what happens is that there's a lot of, you know, flooding damage in these pink areas here. So the, the, the basements get flooded and they're, they're damaged. So here we had built this model to try to understand green infrastructure as a way to mitigate, you know, you know, for climate change issues, like when we have more frequent, like bigger floodings. And so we use the simulation to try to understand then the effect of spatial layout in an area. So not, you know, in a site, not in a whole watershed, but in a neighborhood. When you lay out, you know, green infrastructure all clustered or distributed or following the roads, does it matter? And so, yes, we discovered that it does matter. But there was something else. <coughs> there was something else going on. So here are two different scenarios that people usually go for. Rain barrels. We love rain barrels. They're great. They're cheap. They're very efficient because they're very cheap and they collect water. What if we put rain barrels all over, you know, the buildings here versus maybe scattering a few bioswales? Which scenario could be better? If we have a baseline, we have, of course, no installation cost with no green infrastructure. We have $39,000 in damages and 62% of the uh, rain goes downstream to the neighborhood downstream. If we put rain barrels, it costs about $14,000. The damages are reduced but by very, very little, and we have absolutely no impact on the runoff going downstream. If we have uh, bioswales, they're much more expensive, 350,000, but it reduces damages more, and it reduces the runoff downstream. So which scenario is better? That's to you. The baseline? Uh-huh. Anybody wants to choose any of the other ones? Hmm? The biospheres. So why are you saying biospheres? It's helping. It's helping more than the others, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I always do that. Uh, it's like uh, vegetated gardens that our engineers have engineered soils that can absorb and infiltrate, help to infiltrate water in a rain event. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes. So yes, please. You like the rain barrels. Why do you like the rain barrels? Why do you like the rain barrels? Yeah, sorry, fourteen thousand dollars versus three hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, I think But that's great. So the question is, it depends on who you are. If you're a public official, for example, and you only have $15,000, what are you going to do? If you're a hydrologist and re you really think of like the problem, 
what you're going to do. If you're the poor guy living down here, okay, down here, sorry, I'm messing up the camera, uh, then, you know, no matter what you do, you're always being flooded. I don't like either one of them, okay? So this is to say that simulations are not enough to give us answers. These are coordination problems. There are also trade-offs. There are costs and benefits, and different people in different places bear them, okay? So there's a different distribution. There are also spatial constraints. We might want to do bioswales, you know, in certain places, which means digging down the soil, but that also means that, you know, we have to check other utilities there. That adds another cost to, to this. And of course, there are also diverse stakeholder interests. So it's not about just, you know, creating platforms for solution building through, say, simulations and things like that, but also building platforms to support a discussion around compromise. And for that to happen, there needs to be an awareness of what our values are. Where we stand right now, which sometimes we think we know, but sometimes we actually don't know, but then also understand where other people are in terms of their needs and their um, uh, preferences. So just to show you a little bit of my work, and I'll stop here, we created a platform that does that. So we, we, it is around a simulation that um, represents these biophysical complexity that I was telling you about before, which would be number three here. But we also created these mobile apps that participants around the table, when they're creating scenarios together, like how do we distribute green infrastructure of different kinds around this neighborhood? How do we coordinate with communities around us? Okay, they can do that, but they use these apps to also first rank their priorities. I'm a hydrologist. I'll put all the infiltration stuff, stuff up top. I don't care about cost. I'll put them down at the bottom. But I'm the public official and I have to respond to cost, so I'll put that at the top. And I put other things at the bottom. And I'm the resident and I have a different set of priorities. So with that, whatever comes out of a simulation will be filtered by my values. And so that then the, the scenarios that I will choose or that I will favor are going to be different from what other people favor. But at least understanding that, we can come together into a dialogue where we can see, okay, this is good for me, bad for you. What do we do about it? Do we look for another scenario and think of like how, you know, to sh uh, work with the biophysical process, but also with our different sets of preferences to, to come up with a new, a new idea that we, could, that we could work on? Or now that I understand you, maybe I actually reshuffle my priorities as well because I, I have developed some empathy and understanding. So these are some things that are also adding to the mix of, of the complexity of climate change. So, thank you. So we're going to yeah, we're going to switch now to a more open format for discussion. Um, I guess I'll take a little while to pose some questions to the panelists and, and give them a chance to talk, and then. We'll turn it over to you guys for questions. So um, we could start anywhere. Yeah, we could start with Surat. Thanks. So I think what when you see disasters hitting, whether it be heat waves, flooding, climate-related disasters, it, we we've accepted, I think, unfortunately, a, a reactive approach where we we sit back and we wait till an event occurs. Um, and scramble to try to um, react to that. But a proactive approach, I think, I think is a more, more appealing strategy. We know some of these things are occurring with a certain frequency. And so I guess I'd like to hear from each of, each of your respective fields, um, maybe an example you could share with the, um, with the audience of uh, proactive behavior that's already being done, or your suggestion for proactive behavior that we should be implementing. There is an increased awareness, and uh, we are really in the catch-up mode. And um, and I think there is there was an article published in the journal Lancet. It came out two days ago, and that article touched on this particular issue that we're we're in at the verge of turning climate change. Um, the, the negative impacts of climate change to potentially as a warning system to make a positive change in, uh, in our lives from societal and public health perspective. 
But um, nevertheless, we're still in the early stages. The uh, changes are happening more in technological level. For example, in city, I can give an example from the city of Chicago. Um, they have, um, have uh, done retrofitting of uh, homes with energy efficient systems. So there are is programs here and there from <coughs> transportation planning to retrofitting the d diesel engine um, buses, for example, with more efficient emission control systems. Um, they are happening, uh, but it's, it's, there isn't a comprehensive or more multidisciplinary effort to put this under one umbrella and, and guide the way or, or teach us on how these different forces coming together and impacting either the, the forces that, that, that uh, result in climate change or the adaptation strategies and how the preventive measures are really reducing the effects of climate change. So we um, were really, I think that in terms of the, um, the, the, from public health perspective, we're in the catch up mode and, um, and, and there is some awareness that we need to be more proactive. I think within the context of investors and firms uh, for investment, there's been a huge push of capital with people wanting to invest in companies that are sustainable. So that's been um, pretty promising. From the perspective of firms, part of the argument behind sustainability, aside from uh, what we would probably argue is moral, on a social level, it helps to build social trust and typically during periods of market dislocation, basically when things kind of go crazy, that social trust is really important for people to have confidence and belief in the firm and that actually helps them to raise capital and keep people employed and continue to invest smoothly. Um, that's the good. I think in terms of the bad, part of the challenge that we face is figuring out ways of accounting for the externalities that are produced as a consequence of pollution. Um, for the most part, if you think about a lot of the companies that are pretty heavy in terms of pushing climate change further and further, there has been a push for the banks that provide financing to them to basically be brought to light. So the PNB had a big issue. Um, there's been more of that, but it's very difficult to argue that because the businesses are so interrelated, because your supplier or your producer might be a polluter, it's very difficult to argue that um, a firm is truly clean in terms of the problem. So that's kind of the bad. Uh, yeah, um, good thing and bad things. Um, there's a lot of good things happening uh, in engineering. Um, and in here in Chicago, I mean, I, there were some projects, for instance, that were led together with the uh, Department of Transportation and the Water, the Department of Water Management that I, that I think were great. And in Europe, they're doing a lot of great work. The one thing I love about, um, about Europe, about what the things they're doing there is that climate change is not a political issue. Hmm. So everyone wants to do better. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, here, if you ask anyone, should we invest in infrastructure, everyone's going to say yes, or virtually everyone's going to say yes. And so in, in, in Europe, you, they just try to do it the right way. Uh, yeah, here, not necessarily. Um, one of the things that I think should really change, especially within engineering, and especially within civil engineering, it's uh, cultural change is really needed in terms of taking risks, um, in terms of coming up with designs that are just more risky from a... Um, not even from a safety point of view, but more risky as in, you know, it's not what the code says, it's not what, you know, what, what we've been doing for the past 50 years, but it's for the best. And that's a real problem, that cultural problem. Uh, technologically, again, we're not, we're not there yet, we're not 100%, but we're way, way, you know, we're doing really well. It's more the cultural aspect of doing the right thing, and I know that's a problem in, in well, partly the problem is accountability, you know, you can't fail. You can't do a, if you do a new in type of intersection that doesn't work too well, well, that's not good. So, so just to avoid any kind of failure, and again, we're not talking about safety or anything, right? Just to avoid any kind of failure, we're just gonna keep doing whatever's in the code, and so if it fails, it's like, oh, it's not me, it's in the code, we've been doing that for, the, right. for forever. So there's a big cultural change that's needed, at least in engineering, to, to accept, to take more risks. Again, we're not talking about safety, right? 
but to take more risk and to come up with designs that are just better. And if some of them don't work too well, we won't repeat them. So, um, is this working? Uh, so I think that in line in line with that, you know, like I, I deal with that in planning too. You know, when I when I try to go uh, in in planning settings and offer this possibility of like doing complex system simulations in a participatory manner, and so that people can understand how the problem arises and the complexities of it, like what are the interaction effects of of different decisions uh, and different different actions. Um, it 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 just becomes hard because what that brings about is like all the uncertainty tied to that complexity. And it's not because of lack of data, it's just because that's just how the system works. And there are things that emerge that you don't anticipate until you run a simulation, you run a model and see how things uh, play out. And sometimes in these kinds of systems you have different ends. You can have like the same mechanisms in place but in one simulation you end up with you know, one destination, if you will, like one state of the system, and in another simulation with the same conditions, you might end somewhere else. And so that's a structural complexity and structural uncertainty that these systems have and that we're dealing with. I mean, we're part of them. So that's very unsettling. And when you ask people to say like, well, you know, just understand the problem and let's figure out policy, you know, uh, given this uncertainty, we are not used to doing that. And we're very uncomfortable with that, with that notion. And, uh, and to shift from you know, this mindset of optimization, finding the best solution. If we had all the data, we would know. No, we wouldn't, because it's not an issue of lack of data. It's, it's just a structural uncertainty of the system. And for that, then we have to shift gears and think of robustness. What are policies that would work, whether we end up here or here? And we just haven't, you know, created that that mindset. So there's a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance, because a well, it takes a lot of effort to bring people to a table, interact with these simulations, understand how they work, and and, and you know, it's a, it's a tall order, it is. Um, and, but and making yeah. a decision and owning the decision, right. owning the decision, yeah. which is theirs collectively, right, versus somebody, some expert saying this is what you should do. So there's, there's a lot of that, there's a lot of that certainly uh, going on and it's a challenge and it's part of I think what we're all trying to do with our, uh, with our research. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the, in, with respect to time, because we have about 25 minutes, I'd like to, I have more questions I can ask to the panel, but I think I'd like to hear a little bit from the crowd first and some of your questions. That's okay, okay. get started on that. Um, so. Oh, yeah, so we, we can accept questions via cards or also if you're comfortable just raising your hand you want to ask the question, we can do it first. But I'll start with the first one here and, and I can open it up to the panel. I'm not sure if anyone wants to comment on it. So the question is Lyme disease seems to be on the rise. I've never made the connection to climate change. Would you, would you please connect the dots um, here? So. Um, I guess I, I can start by commenting on, on the, the question of Lyme disease here, uh, though I don't know too much about specific habitats of deer ticks. But one, one issue is that um, certain pests are, their populations are managed by deep frosts and deep freezes, and so in the case where winters are maybe just <coughs> slightly warmer and the probability of deep frosts decreased slightly, you begin to see complex population dynamics where if you're not getting a hard kill off of this particular pest um, on a given year and that population is, isn't able to grow and, and spread. So um, that is certainly the case, something I know a little bit more about, which is the bark beetle infestation, which is devastating forests in the western U.S., is that they require frost to kill off those beetles. And a few years in a row where you don't get those frosts, and that starts to, um, starts to accelerate the population. So um, that's probably all I could say about that. I don't know if you have other, if anyone else would like yeah, to add to that. I think the, I think <coughs> you summarized it really well. The issue is the, um, the, um, that uh, 
couldn't survive in the past um, are able to survive in the changing climate. Um, and, and that results in increase in population of ticks, and that results in increase <coughs> of probability of contact with um, ticks. So then that results in, obviously, the formation of the disease. So, um, so the ticks are mainly encountered in the northeast in the U.S., particularly in Connecticut. And um, so we are seeing increase in vector-borne diseases overall, including Lyme disease. That is, um, that is the one associated with increased ticks population. I can also, uh, totally anecdotally, but um, I work in a, in a, in a uh, restored prairie site outside of Chicago. Two years ago, I was probably picked off 100 ticks from working out there throughout mm -hmm. the year. And this past year, I picked off just about zero. So mm -hmm. there is also co very complex population mm -hmm. dynamics mm -hmm. that maybe have nothing to do with climate change in, in that case. But, so it's, a, it's a, a quite a complicated question. So. Um, anything else? Just maybe Probably. the ticks became complacent. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Well, um, but, there, but there's also the um, the public health uh, prevention um, programs in place. Yeah. That um, West Nile, for example, a virus um, prevention uh, disease prevention program in Illinois is particularly strong because it was the first state with the you know disease manifesting itself mm. in the in the U.S. Uh, so our state had to have particular emphasis and focus on it, and that resulted in more awareness in our state about vector-borne diseases and more uh, institution of and implementation of more strong uh, public health prevention programs. So I'll, I'll move on to the next question, and I, I think I'm going to target this one at, at you, Matt. So. How can we bring attention to our current goal of the impact on the economy of climate change? So, for example, the cost of hurricane damage to the federal budget. So, I, I think rephrasing that um, a little bit is there's strong economic, negative economic impacts that occur from climate change. So, how do we bring that to light? How to mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So. We typically think of this as having direct and indirect costs. The direct costs would be um, buildings that are destroyed or roads, bridges, etc. The indirect costs are a bit harder to account for. It's a little bit harder to account for how long it's going to take for companies to rebuild, for families that have been displaced, etc. In terms of doing that a little bit better, unfortunately, because these events are becoming more frequent, um, we're having more and more data, which is, again, not ideal. Uh, but there have been sort of two big pushes. The first has been because reinsurance companies are often the ones who are on the hook to provide the financing necessary for the rebuilding process, they've been making their data um, more publicly available. And there's been a big push from the CRED, basically this Center for uh, Extreme Weather Stuff in Belgium, to make that data publicly available. So that's been very helpful. Um, in terms of actually accounting for what happens, I think part of it is because climate change is such a political issue, even uh, places where you have incredibly high incidence of weather-related events, so that could be a direct health event like Zika in Florida or hurricanes, um, it's still incredibly difficult to even get people to agree at what's causing these problems. So that's, that's, there's not much of an economic solution to, to that. Can, oh, yeah. can I add to that? Um, I, I think that also like part, part of the issue is again like the, the, the aspect of trade-offs and coordination. So at this point I think that we know enough, I mean there are a lot of studies out there that, that show even though of course some of them are being discredited by some um, but, you know, there are studies that are, and, and I see it in the media more and more, that, you know, they're pushing for this idea of, like, climate change damages, it's really costing our economy billions, et cetera. 
And this has happened, and it, ha you know, before with, with other kinds of issues where, you know, like whether it's just air pollution, you know, where we know what the problem is. And, and we know already the impacts, we know even the causes. But the problem is, again, that there are trade-offs. So whatever we decide to do, there's going to be costs and benefits, and for different people. And what needs to happen is more a conversation about, it's not about getting more data about the problem, it's really enabling the conversation about what those trade-offs are and how we're going to deal with them. And I think that that is, is a, an important part of the conversation. And then I was thinking also, I was reading yesterday about, you know, like an article, I don't remember which, which newspaper it was, um, on whether, like, if we all turn vegetarian, if we could really resolve the issue. And, and I was looking at how the article was written, and it really struck me because they were, they were, they were talking about, you know, what would happen to the land if, you know, we removed ranching and whether that was better because then development would come, would come in, like residential development, and is that better with the lawns and stuff and that, the soil and the needs of the soil? And I'm like, all that is true, but you're not really focusing on the question that, you know, you started this article with. And it just, you know, there are all these confounding factors because, again, there's a lot of complexity tied to it. And so I'm thinking also that the role of, of the media in sometimes creating a little bit more confusion about this than uh, clarification, especially because we need the public involved in this conversation. And, uh, and that really makes things hard for, you know, people like us who are trying to generate knowledge to inform the public about what could be done and what the different alternatives are. So I think that it puts us in a place of like, maybe we need to be, you know, better communicators, you know, to the public. Uh, and engaging the public more actively in terms of understanding, again, like these interactions are really clarifying the debate rather than obscuring it. Yeah, and I'd also add something else too, which I think we, we understand from things like having a car or a house that uh, being proactive and, and taking care of preventative maintenance is, uh, I would say, usually cheaper than reacting to uh, the damage there. And so I, I do think there's a gap to be bridged there. And it is m my sense that if we were proactive, it'd be cheaper in the long run than kind of waiting to having to rebuild an entire grid or the, these sorts of things. And so and I, think, I think there's a way that that can be broached anecdotally because we have that experience as ourselves. Mm -hmm. so. um, uh, that question. I don't know if you can answer quickly, but given the large-scale climate events that have occurred, uh, do you anticipate at some point in the future that you may see climate refugees in the United States, uh, particularly climate refugees who may want to migrate to the Great Lakes area given just what's happening, what the potential that could happen along the East Coast and the Florida coastline and the, the Gulf of Mexico? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, th there's already, I would say, moving a population within the U.S. I don't know if you'd consider, you know, what happened in New Orleans had, there were refugees who weren't coming across the border, but they were coming across the border of Louisiana and, um, and Houston. So, yeah, I think it's already unfolding, but when it becomes international, there's, it's more fraught with mm -hmm. political contention. Sure. Yeah. So I, I Chicago certainly has a bright future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, all the coastal areas are going to get flooded, so Chicago has a bright future. So invest now in Chicago. <laughs> um, you know, and there's another point to that, which I wanted to even talk about before, was um, is the fact that even when something happens now, and, and Harvey right now in Texas is a great example. Hurricane Harvey happened, a large portion of Houston was destroyed, and now they want to rebuild it exactly the same as it was before. And we know it's the wrong thing to do. We, we, we might not be too sure about what the right solution is, but we know it's the wrong thing to do. And what's, what's going to happen now is that some money is going to come from somewhere. And a lot of investment is going to be poured into making something. And it's going to be the same thing again in a few years. Um, it's, if, if you ever go to, and I don't have, there's trade-off. And, and if you ever go to Galveston, I went to Galveston about two years ago. And it's in Texas, in southern Texas. And they had a huge hurricane in Hurricane Ike, I think. In, in maybe 10 years ago. If you go there now, you see all houses, but they're on stilts. 
So it's really weird when you walk there and you're just there and you see all the houses on stilts. And like, do you really think, I mean, maybe that's gonna be good for 10 years, but do you really think, you know, your house is, is good now for 50, 50 years? I mean, we should really be doing something else. I'm not too sure what, and I'm sure, I think the trade-off question that Mora raises is a really good one, um, but that's a problem to invest in Chicago. <laughs> Um, I wanted to, there are so many questions. Thank you all for speaking so eloquently and clearly, especially for people who don't necessarily understand these things. I'm trained as a historian, so I think about time and change. Um, and, and I guess one question I have to this point that um, Sybil's making about what it means to perhaps invest in a place like Chicago is that it's, you know, what does it mean to recreate historical systems so how can investment, and I mean that monetarily and psychically and institutionally, um, to really address the realities that we, we know about the inequality that has been built in this city and that you have Altgeld Gardens, which has the highest rate of cancer in, I think, the entire state, if not more than that, Midwest maybe, um, which was a, a a public housing project built for returning African-American veterans after World War II. It's in the far south side. It's completely isolated. Um, and so I guess I wonder about this. Like, I guess what is fascinating to me is how much we know that change is the only constant. Mm -hmm. And then this question of what, of how we count time I think is really interesting because as a historian, I'm much more comfortable with centuries and you're talking about hundreds of thousands of years, that's a different kind of time. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about that and how, I guess for me, ultimately, how we create behavior change is part of it. Absolutely. So how we make people see and do things differently. I don't know, there's a lot there, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm so fascinated by the way everyone, by hearing how my colleagues approach these topics in ways that make me think about my own work. So I guess the question is, how do we invest in ways that don't replicate the same thing? Because I might say that the racial segregation of Chicago is the same as putting a house on stilts. Right. Right? And, that, um, and then how do we actually make people change their behavior in ways that is not that does that recognizes the reality that oftentimes behavior change happens by a very few and affects a very many. Mm -hmm. um, well, of course, I have my biases. I am also the director of the Urban Data Visualization Lab, uh, but you know, visualization I think is very important, and especially because with things like infrastructure, you know, you can't experiment. It's very costly to experiment, right? So relying on visualization to be able to see, as you're saying, you know, like the interaction effects, like the possible unintended consequences of our decisions, I think, is really important. And, and I believe, really, that it needs to be part of the decision-making process and needs to be brought. And we have a lot of technology to facilitate that, you know, to be brought into planning and policy-making arenas. You know, and, and at different levels. So there's a lot that needs to happen at the local level, like uh, Matt was saying, and also like at the you know higher levels as well, and you know in between. So, but I think that visualization needs to be more actively part of these kinds of settings. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, community empowerment is critical mm -hmm. because those of us who generate data and um, share the data with our communities in terms of the specific environmental risk factors that they are disproportionately burdened with. When they see that kind of spatial data, mm -hmm. they, then they are armed with knowledge to seek change in their communities from their political leaders, from their um, there, there is community awareness building, and, and that's what, with our research, this is what we facilitate. Mm -hmm. And um, the issue is 
taking, in, 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 and that is really critical component, but then once the empowerment does happen, how do you actually bring about real change? And that requires really a commitment, and, uh, and, and not only commitment in, um, in, uh, in, in ideological manner, but also commitment in terms of resources, mm -hmm. commitment in terms of um, making um, all the necessary components available so that, um, so that things can actually ch can change. And I think that's the most difficult aspect of it. I, I mean, I can just say also one thing. Um, back to my graph, forcing people to do something is not the solution, right? You want to have the right incentives. That's one, that's one thing. The second thing is changing behavior is, is important, but it's not 100% of the thing. I mean, when I think about greenhouse gases and where they come from and how they impact climate change, we've got electricity. Um, people don't really have anything to do. As long as you have electricity, you don't care where it comes from. So whether it's from solar or from coal, uh, it doesn't really impact you. You don't have to change your behavior. Maybe you want to reduce your consumption of electricity. Maybe there's some behavior component, but it doesn't have to. Your water, uh, how much, where it comes from, again, you know, how much energy is being put, you don't really have to change your behavior. It's best if you actually change a little bit some things and then you reduce your water consumption, but you don't have to right now. Building energy use, so cooling and heating, a lot of it comes from um, make sure your, your house is well insulated, and these becomes uh, even codes or standards to use. The only place where your behavior really has to change is with transportation. Uh, there, you know, we need to um, really use more transit, or, you know, or I mean, or change something, cars that emit less, but that's really the, the main one, but there's so much we can do without even changing the behavior of anyone, or at least not, not, the, not, not, not us on a day-to-day, -day, but decision makers have to change the way they make decisions. But behavior is one thing, but I mean, we shouldn't get stuck on behavior because we can do so much without even bothering anyone uh, and continue with our lifestyles. Uh, may I disagree? <laughs> well. <laughs> because I mean, it, it depends on, if I may, and then yeah, go we'll, to the we'll question. Take one more question, but if you get to right. the Yeah, I, I, I disagree with that. At least in uh, water is where I do most of, of, of my research. And the issue is like, yes, we could stop where we are. But then again, it's like, what are we trying to do as a system? So in some areas, for example, there's a lot of push for growth and adding more people. And if we're thinking even also like climate refugees, <coughs> you know, there's gonna be more people, which means overall, if we don't individually change behavior, we're gonna have much more consumption. Do we have the resources to support that? And we're like, okay, but we want growth, bigger tax base, that's great. How far are you willing to go in order to conserve the water resource? Are you willing to go to bucket showers? Something to think about. I'm, I'm serious. I'm well, not kidding. You know, I mean, so, so, gray, gray, so gray, water, gray water reuse. So sure, things we it can has do. a cost in electricity too. But in all of these, there are pushes and pulls. You know, so there, there's trade-offs in all of these. So that's why I'm saying, like, you know, there, there are different things that we have to think about in terms of how you know, like how all these decisions come together and interact to create, you know, this complexity. And what are we willing to trade off? What are we willing to give up? And, you know, what are we gonna do about it? So I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a more difficult conversation. Yeah, yeah I agree that it's, uh, it is complex because we have many different exposure pathways and uh, that has, um, implications f not only for health but for um, for our environment and um, so reducing the, the problem into a single entity is is not going to really serve our society well we need to think in multi-dimensional mm -hmm. terms right. so I'd like to take we have time for one more question in the back and uh, so if I'll try to make this, yours. Yeah. make this quick, I guess a two-part question. One, I'm here because I feel like in my lifetime, I've seen, I grew up in Chicago, I'm seeing climate change. You know, when I was young, it snowed yeah. all the time, and yeah. I was always outside playing in the snow. Now for my kids, they wear a snowsuit one time, and it's done. So I want to know, is there really any local data to really see the rate of change in our climate uh, for the Midwest? And then the second part is sort of a more of a national or international look. 
essentially when people don't have job security, when they don't feel secure in their own their their lives, it's very hard for them to have a global perspective such as climate change. And one of the ways I think that we've alienated people in our country, if you think about people who are coal miners and all this whole you know, divisive you know, politics, is how do we reach out to incorporate uh, those groups into the conversation so they don't feel alienated? I mean, if we're here in the Midwest and we're not in a flood zone or hurricane, we're very safe, we can take our time, and that urgency is not on our part in comparison to the coast, but it obviously is something where, you know, I'm upset that we're not part of the Paris Climate Accord or whatever. You know, I want to do something about that, but my urgency may be different from them on the coast and how we can work together to bring everyone in uh, to our conversation. So your first question is quite easy, so, so thank you for that. There is uh, data records, temperature records from Chicago that date um, to the mid-19th century, and they document the warming we've experienced here. So um, that's well documented and publicly available. I don't, didn't show up on any of the slides, but um, that's, a, that's a public resource and, and something that you can include. What's that? Uh, the best resource I would recommend is uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, or a website called Climate Explorer, um, which would allow you to visualize how Chicago's climate has, has changed. Um, so so that, that is quite available. As, as far as bridging the gap, um, I guess I'll open it to people more know more about society because I think it seems like a, it's a serious, there's a serious divide there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, that's exactly the kind of conversation we want to support with the visualization technology that we've developed to really bring different people with different values to the table, including the ones who right now are benefiting from, you know, or benefiting from, you know, the way that we currently do things. Because, you know, like for example, for the coal miners, I don't know necessarily. I think that there would be so many benefits if they could be part of the transformation to different kinds of energy production. Because being in a coal mine, gosh, it's, it's, it's a terrible impact on their own health. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, in terms of salaries, what they're, what their salaries are, I don't even know, but it, they need to be part of the conversation. And so the idea is to create the platforms for that to not become just a confrontation, but something that they can you know, voice and work together on. So put, let's put all this complexity on the table, both the social, the, the diversity of values, and, the, and, and then the complexity of the, the system that we're working with so that we can understand it and understand each other and try to really move forward towards a compromise not a consensus, because I don't know that we can all agree on anything, but a good enough solution that we can all live with. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we need. Yeah, I'd also add that, I mean, environmental protection wasn't always a political, such a political issue. I mean, it's the EPA, as people know, was formed by Richard Nixon in 1970. It was, mm -hmm. came out of a Republican presidency. I mean, environmental protection should be I mean, it used to be a more of a universal value, I, I think, mm -hmm. if I, I, it's my sense. And so I, I think part of it is recognizing there are politics involved and maybe how we choose to pay for certain things. And I, I re respect that, but a common goal of, you know, uh, not a rapidly changing climate and clean air, that should, it doesn't need to be you know, so politically device, divisive. Yeah. And it wasn't um, not that long ago, so. Yeah. I wanna thank, our panelists for joining us and giving us such an amazing afternoon um, of their insights into their research. So if you'll join me in thanking them and thank you all for coming. I bet they'll stick around and answer questions.